The Richmond Shakespeare Society can't claim to be quite as Mac and Regent's Park, but we did do our first outdoor production in 1935. Um, and with an exception of a couple of years during the Second World War, have to on um, every year since. Um, with the exception of last year, we usually run for a week's performance, as Anne said, in a local garden beside the river and the council. Uh, we do erect a stage there with the lighting grid and due to our proximity to Heathrow amplification. Um, that is, we find absolutely necessary now um, and immensely improves the audience um, experience of the event. One very important thing that we find is that the audience expectations of our outdoor production is absolutely and completely different to the expectations of our indoor ones. Um, they, they really come for the event as much as for the actual production itself. And we very much um, have served that for it to be, as Stuart was saying, um, relaxed, family friendly, informal, it's bring your own picnic, bring your own chairs, etc. Um, our programming, again, we tend to be, we tend to do Shakespeare, not absolutely totally, but we very much aim for productions, the big, colourful, fast, loud, lots of music, lots of movement, um, never leave a bare stage whatsoever, that's absolute death in and out of production. Um, so scene changes are absolutely minimal and have to be choreographed in. The acting style, it has to be bigger, we're playing to over two and a half times the number of people that we play to in our theatre venue. It has to be a bigger style, you have to face out to the audience, stand in profile and away from even with amplification, the lines will be lost and the audience won't follow it. Um, we do matinee performances alongside evening ones. So again, we have to be very wary of any effects that we build into the production, particularly as inevitably and to our absolute delight, that is one we want to get younger audiences in. Um, two years ago, we did Midsummer Night's Dream and the audience, the front part of the audience on the picnic blankets was, pick, was packed with young children and it was an absolute delight to play for them and with that absolute joy of knowing that you're doing for a play for an audience uh, you're doing a performance for an audience that have never seen this play before um be very wary of things like sight lines we've learned over the years um you do actually spend more time blocking an outdoor production than you do an indoor one, partly because of the lighting as the performance goes on, but also because the audience are more flexible in where seating, you have to leave things very open. Don't put, don't ever put people too close together. Social distancing on stage for an outdoor production, actually for us, the problem at all. If people are closer than two meters, they're probably either going to kiss or kill each other, um, which have their moments, but generally speaking, <laughs> That's the only thing you want them that close together. Um, I know I've concentrated mainly on the artistic things here. We have an absolutely brilliant um, technical team who lead us in turning our site from eight o'clock on a Friday morning, come rain or shine into a stage where we can do a full dress rehearsal by eight o'clock on the Sunday evening before um, the opening performance on a Monday night. It is a phenomenal amount of work. We've built up a wonderful team um, which seems to be ever changing and ever growing as the years go on. Um, and we can't wait to get back to doing one again this year. Thank you. Okay, Simon. Um, Jane's just suggested, um, do you want to say anything about the requirements for, for your venue? <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, as Stuart was saying, it's a long, arduous task um, getting the full blown council permissions. Um, it is now quite a mighty pack of risk assessments and detail about not the production itself, but about the event um, that we're mounting in the gardens. Um, we do have generators in to um, allow us to power things. Of course, that brings in a whole reactors. We are able to close our venue in the evenings um, to the public and it is only accessible through a couple of gates, meaning that's quite straightforward. But again, a whole raft of things which have to be sorted with the council around that, publishing notices in advance and all the rest of it. Um, our production this year is going to be the 2nd of August and we are 
we have had our first proper discussions with the council just this week on it and you can guarantee we'll be talking to the council every week between now and then um, it is a lot of detail that they that they nowadays want and building a full-blown risk assessment of not what's going on on stage but for the entirety of the function including for the audience coming in and leaving in the dark don't forget that they might well be hitting parts of um the area the local area um where there aren't normally too many people later in the evenings and again yes the impact on local residents for that we're lucky there's only active house um where the bishop of kensington happens to live in the immediate vicinity of the um Reduction. So we stick a note to his door and invite him along one night for free. Um, but if you are in a more residential area, again, it's something that you very much have to bear in mind. Okay, Simon, thank you very much for that. Um, if we hand over now to Carol, Progress Theatre, who's had an, a lot of experience also of working with Reading Council uh, on the on the two venues that they use. Okay, Carol. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, Progress Theatre has been in Reading for a good many years. Tony uh, will my, will pick that up further. But in terms of the open air productions, I've been involved now over the last six or seven years in producing the open air productions, which, as was mentioned previously, um, with the two sites that we use is the Cavisham Court Gardens or the Reading Abbey Ruins. The open air progress um, the Shakespeare productions were historically done in the Abbey Ruins right up until 2008, when the last performance was held there. And it was due to the venue being closed because it was unsafe for the public to attend. The, uh, the walls were crumbling and they were going to have to close it down for refurbishment. So we then moved to Cavisham Court Gardens, which again is still in Reading, so it's still with the same town that we were dealing with. And we performed in Cavisham Court Gardens for a number of years until 2018 when the Abbey Ruins was reopened to the lake. Um, and we were offered the opportunity to renew our license or to re-establish our previous license for that venue, which we do. And we moved back in there July of 2018 and reopened with much ado about nothing. The following year, we did King Lear and we were supposed to have had obviously an event last year, which we didn't. And this year we will be doing, we are going back in on a much, uh, on a scale down in terms of audience and everything else, but we are going to be doing Romeo and Juliet. Now, the venue behind me in that picture there, as you can see, is what is the dormitory area and it's this open grassy plain which has an ever so slight incline to it um and we are going to be performing to the one side where um that area is you can see the wall there and that is where the stage is going to be so the audience themselves will be seated in that middle green area that we will be doing bubbles as um you know the other people have been saying you've had to have the uh, family groups or whatever it might be. So we had a site visit two weeks ago and we are now looking at how many walls we're going to be able to put into that space, what the, dif the distances need to be between each bubble and we'll probably arrange for some for two people, some for four, some for six as the maximum. Um, we have the area on my on the other side, which you can't really see, see a bit of the the, the there, the grass verge, is we, we can probably have individuals sitting in that area. So we can have singles that will be give a few market sales that we could probably get. Luckily as well, all of the paths around the entire area that we're looking at are two meters. They're two meters in width. So we don't have to worry about additional distancing measures because those paths are a clear delineation between the stage area that will be over there and the seating area that will go on that end as well. So it, it's actually, it could have been made for COVID. So it's quite, it's quite remarkable. Um, in terms of licensing, it's obviously been touched on. It is vitally important that you do keep in very close communication with whatever cow happens to be looking after the area that you're in. We are 
uh, very fortunate in that our license we've had for many, 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 many years previously, when we had to move back into the into the Cavisham Court Gardens, we had to get a separate, a different license. But because we'd already had a license for performances of this type, it wasn't that onerous to to get a uh, to apply for a new license. Uh, at the time, because it wasn't known whether this venue would reopen, we allowed the Abbey Ruins license to lapse. So that meant that going back in in 2018, we had to reapply for the uh, for the line in its entirety. That meant the advertising, the six weeks period beforehand. However, once that was done, now with our productions every year, it's a license fee that we pay that keeps our license current. All we then have to do is submit an event plan every year together with the risk assessment. So all it has already uh, now gone in for July's uh, performance this year. And uh, they're asking us to now go for a site meeting with them. We're organized in the next week and they can walk around with me and we'll talk, talk it all out. But in that event plan, we we literally have a plan of a PDF file where we mark out where we're going to place the toilets, where the staging is going to be, where we're planning on having the seating, that it, everything is provided to them. We also have to um, send notification to the local police authorities. We also have to get them involved. We have to send through to the fire departments. Now, we don't do that uh, separately. The council does all of that side for us. Maybe we're lucky in that, uh, in that regard. I don't know how it works with other councils. But the Reading Council actually does all of that work for us. So it is, it is fabulous that they do. Um, our production is always live, which has historically been in July. And this year we're running from the 14th to the 24th of July. So again, every single one has spoken about weather. We're in the UK. We're going to have inclement weather. We never know when it's going to happen. As far as we are concerned, the way we do it, again, like others have said, we prepare for the worst. And we always have what we call the wet weather version. Um, and we could have a number of wet weather versions, depending if it's just mildly raining. And then we could have a really serious one where we strip out, have to strip out all of the fighting scenes, whatever it might be. So we have a couple of versions that we can deal with. Um, cast are very familiar with having to go off stage and put uh, clear plastic max on and come back on stage covered in, in a clear plastic Mac, which we also hand out to audience members as well. And again, as was mentioned before, it is entirely up to the stage manager as to whether we have to cancel a performance for whatever reason, or whether we have to temporarily pause it while the squeegees are brought out and the uh, stage managers <laughs> sweep the, the rain off uh, whatever stage we're working with at the time. We've the two previous performances we had in fixed seating, which is uh, not exactly like Tony's picture shows, but that is how it has been done previously. But this year we're, re we're reverting back to the picnic style because we just cannot put um, uh, the, the fixed seating in because that would be hired in. So we'll be doing uh, picnic style blankets, you know, bring your own camping chairs. We also do, again, have chair hire. The um, the other things that are involved, obviously, are the hiring in of toilets. The venue itself does not have toilets on site. We have hire toilets. We have to arrange for them to be cleaned on a regular basis. They have to be padlocked, closed when we leave in the evening because it is open during the day. We are lucky that they close it at 5.30 for us. It is then closed to the public and it becomes our space until sunrise the next day. So we have to be able to close those toilets. We lock them. Um, they have to be clean, so we've got to get them, the guys to come in and clean them out. We have to have first aid on site, so we have to, to we have to hire those. We go to sorry, not hire. We have to um, get them in, and it's generally, unfortunately, now a, it's a private company because all of the charitable ones are no longer providing this sort of first aiding for events. Um, fire extinguishers, we have to hire a container in which to store all of our costumes, the props, the everything else. So all of that is locked away during the night. Again, with the venue that we have, 
are lucky that we can do that. The council is very accommodating. Bar service is outsourced. We did it ourselves previously up until we moved in three years ago, but we just decided it was it was so much work for our members, bearing in mind we're an amateur group, for them to actually have to store and supply and do the bar as well. Outsourcing was the best idea that we've we've ever come up with. So we will be continuing with that. We've got gazebos up, cast and crew, as you have, and we have one that we have keep dedicated for first aid, um, for, for first aid purposes. We also hire a bin in. Okay, Carol, that's, that's yeah. I think we've, we've gone through all the things I, I had on my list. Um, I know we're yes. now very short of time, but um, perhaps mm. if Tony could say a few words about the artistic side, would that be okay? Yes, thank you. Yep, sure. Um, right, well, uh, I've noted a few things that I, I think are relevant. A lot of things uh, uh, other speakers have gone through, but I think uh, um, I think the weather is obviously something that's uh, important. And uh, uh, it's not only um, uh, wet weather, it can be hot weather. It can also be something you have to um, count off. Uh, we've stage productions within the Abbey Ruins, um, uh, within the chapter house, as you can see behind me, this it's, it's an area that's four walls and uh, it can be get, get quite hot in there. So um, uh, one thing, w w when it's very hot and people have had a couple of drinks at the bar at, uh, during the interval, you you have to, um, people can get quite sleepy. <laughs> so you've, you've got to maintain energy, you've got to think about uh, how you can um, keep the energy going, keep people on their feet, keep people interested and watching. Um, there's nothing worse than people in the back row, especially in the back rows, just falling asleep in the middle of the production. Uh, you will get a few because there's always a few people who've been a bit tired or whatever. But, uh, so I, th I think it's important with open air theatre is, um, is another, it's been said before, uh, energy is keeping um, coming in with a starting with a bang and keeping the energy going throughout entrances and exits should be um fast and uh keep going no gaps try and avoid any gaps between um uh between sort of uh between the scenes what well, one thing I don't think anybody else has mentioned. I know you said that you, because it's open air, you often hire a voice coach. Yes. To, uh, yes. One thing we, we, we sometimes hire a, a voice coach, not for the whole production, but for sessions with, with the cast. Um, a lot of people come in, uh, especially when you have an open air audition, it's, it's good to hear people from a distance, but uh, it, it's still surprising how many people um, still... Um, they still perform as if they're a small theatre, and in fact, they've got to fill the area, um, and they've they've got to project. Uh, behind me, we're fortunate. Behind me, when we perform the chapter, which we won't be doing this year, we're performing in a different area of the ruins. Um, we're quite fortunate there; it's got four walls, and uh, the acoustics are very good. Uh, so uh, it's not so difficult in there. But um, when we perform in the gardens, and um, and in fact, where we'll be performing this year in the, uh, in the dormitory area, which you can see behind uh, Carol there, it's a little bit more open. And uh, it's important that uh, people project and people um, uh, taught to project. A lot of actors like to think that they know how to do it, but it's surprising how they start to forget when they're uh, mid-flow and their voices drop. Mm -hmm.